Hello. Hey, I never tried with a microphone before, so please tell me if it's not going through. Thank you for taking the time to sit here and not outside in the sun. We really appreciate it. If we talk too slow or too soft, please let us know, or too hard. We'd first like to introduce ourselves. So my name is Gide. I'm an agile coach, um, and I am from Denmark. I work with a lot of different companies about how do we introduce change. Uh, and my main topic is how do we make the world a better place, and how do we help people have the courage at work and in their personal lives. So I'm Lillian. You can find me on, on Twitter with double L's. I'm an agile coach as well. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I love to help people to have more fun in their work, to become more effective, to, to make happy customers so that they actually are pleased with what they do and they go to, to their work with, with pleasure every day. If you want to know more about ourselves, we only have 30 minutes, so we're not going to say anything more. Just find us around and talk to us. So, first we would like you all, in good tradition of this conference, to stand up. I would like you to change something about your appearance. Anything. Okay, so now I would like you to change something about the person to the right of you. If you don't have anyone to the right of you, just find someone in the back of you. Okay, well, thank you. You can sit down now. Kasia mentioned this morning that she did not have many pictures of cats, as she's supposed to have, so we're going to make up for that. This is the first one. This is the, the general reaction of people to change. Why? Why do we need to change? Why do we need to change again? It's a natural reaction, and it's okay. Sometimes people think that people who, who have fear or who have resistance to change are difficult people, people who, who do not really want to change, but often that's not the case. They just need more information. They, they, uh, they have problems with the uncertainty. We all have problems with uncertainty. Um, I don't like it when my supermarket changes everything around, because then I walk in, and then I have to think about my, what I usually do automatically, like here's the milk, here's the bread, now I have to look around, where is everything? So that's one issue, and it's laziness, to be honest. We are lazy. Gita will tell you more about this. And on the other hand, there's, there's um, um, uncertainty about what will happen, what will be the case. Even if I change it myself, like I want to go to the hairdresser, it's my choice to go to the hairdresser, but there's some discomfort because I don't know what the outcome is. So it's natural to have resistance to change. I would like you ask, to ask you all, who changed back what they changed to themselves already? Wow, pretty good. Who changed what someone else changed for them? Well, that's pretty good. Usually, it's even harder to have change that stays. Well, of course, you're a group of people who are agile and you like change, you embrace change, so any change will be sustainable really fast. But to get people to change is the first step, but to keep the change sustainable is the next step. Often, people say, I saw it on Twitter a few times, people don't mind change, but they mind to be changed. I think people actually do mind change, even if it's from the inside, but because it, it, it offers discomfort. Tom was saying that people don't mind a change that they um, offer themselves. I think that's because they've already been through a process. They already have been through a process of changing their perception, but not their behavior yet. And because perception is the most difficult thing to change, they've already been through it, the first process. Um, yeah, and it also has a lot to do with something we heard yesterday from Liz that once we change something, we actually change our identity. And that makes it really hard for us to change, but it also makes it hard for other people to accept changes. So I've been through a great change process since I came to the Agile community. I used to be terrified of talking in front of my own team. 
And I'm kind of like, oh, I'll go to a strange country and talk in front of 100 people, no problem. And actually, my surroundings found it's really difficult because my identity changes. So even if we embrace this change ourselves, which is hard enough, our surroundings also have problems embracing our changes. So we also want to wanna mention that what we mentioned before by other people, change is about people. It's not about a new structure. It's not about a new way of working. Change is about people. And we should take into account their resistance, their fears, their, their objections. So we should always take them very seriously, because without the people, we won't get anywhere. First of all, we will want to introduce to you some um, um, reasons why resistance is there. And then from our own experience, we will mention some of the stuff that we think could help, help ourselves if we feel resistance to change or help others if we feel they have resistance to change. First one is fear. It's fear. Often when we when things change, some kind of fear comes over us. I want to divide that into two categories. One is self-doubt. Can I do this? It's like when you go to the, the uh, new school, when you went to high school, you feel fear because you don't know, can I handle this school? Uh, can I do all the stuff they ask from me? So you feel a certain fear to do something, which is very natural. Um, I once worked for um, uh, a company that, that um, had a lot of systems, a lot of old systems, and all these systems um, uh, were going to be transformed, so they only had like four or five systems left. And one of the older programmers, he was around 60, he had a, 60, he had a lot of uh, resistance to this. He didn't want to do it. I was, it was like 10 years ago, so I was around uh, 29, and I asked him, what are you afraid of? Which is a really bad question for a 29-year-old to ask a 60-year-old, because he said, I'm not afraid of anything, I can do anything. But in the end, he, he told me that he wasn't sure if he could learn a new language. And it was important for him because he was still doing assembler and all the new systems would be written in, in other languages, in newer languages. So I asked him, do you want to try? Because he was almost on pension le level. So if he, would, if he didn't want to try, we weren't going to force him. But would you like to try? And he said, yeah, I would like to try if I have the chance to opt out, if I think I, I just can do it. So we gave him some security. And... Um, he got some training, and then in the first minutes, when, when someone started doing a small thing, change a small thing, he would sit next to them and just ask questions. Then he would do small things himself with someone sitting next to him. And in the end, he could do some small stuff. He's, he, before he got turned 64, he didn't get into real big stuff, but he did make small changes. And the, the, the good thing about it was that he still was part of a team. If he didn't want to do this, we would have to set him aside somewhere, and he would have been miserable for the last four years of his uh, career. And he was really against me. I hope he wasn't against me personally, but against the change I brought. He saw me as the person bringing it. And when I came back two years later, I walked in, and he was like, oh, are you going to help us again? I'm so happy to see you. So suddenly he was a big fan. Which it's nice to have fans sometimes. The other side is uncertainty. And uncertainty can be real just as self-doubt, actually. Uncertainty is more about um, what will this mean? What will this change mean for me? Will I lose my job? Will I lose a certain position I got within this organization? Um, in, in, a, in one organization where we were, there was uncertainty. But there was one certainty, no one would lose their job. It was really important to get that uncertainty out of the way, so people would get a bit more relaxed. There was another certainty, though. They had to apply for a new job. So they would be placed into a new position. And actually, the uncertainty of not knowing if that would happen was worse than the certainty that knowing that it would happen, even though it was not good news for them. They really saw this as a bad thing. It's like when you're waiting for a train and it's delayed. You don't like that it's delayed, but it's easier if you know why it is delayed. If somewhere there's a sign that says um, there was a, uh, an accident and it will be like 10 minutes later. So uncertainty is worse than hearing something that's not fun. So the other part, and some of the things that does, is that our brain is really, really, really lazy. So we kind of have two ways of thinking, basically. I'm not going to go into a lot of neurosurgery, but one part of the brain is the one who does things automatically, or almost automatically. And that is where our brain likes to be, because it doesn't use a lot of energy. So there's a lot of the stuff that we do that we don't think about. So if I had to stand here and think about, okay, so how do I actually move my legs? So I need to lift it and move it over here at the same time as I'm talking and at the same time I'm holding something. 
then I would be in problem. So the brain has this mechanism of making things automatic, so it doesn't use a lot of energy on it. And every time we are exposed to change and every time we need to learn new stuff, our brain needs to work harder. Which means that the natural reaction of a brain is to say, can I just do what I'm used to? It's just nicer and more comfortable and it's easy. So basically our brain is also very lazy. So when we do all these changes, we need to learn new stuff and it will take up a lot of energy. And if we are not careful, uh, we will use up all our energy. So that's also one of the reasons is that our brain is so lazy. And there's a good reason for that because we need as much energy as possible to survive. And it's the same thing that makes us scared. And there's a reason to have all these fears because it is to help us survive. Some people talk about not being afraid, but once you're afraid, it's your brain telling you something. And of course we have these initial reactions, like if we see a big animal, we are either supposed to kill it or run away, or at least try to kill it. Um, and that's how our brain reacts. But there's a reason for this. There's actually a reason. There's a dangerous animal next to me. So when we feel the fear, we also want to look into it and see why am I actually afraid of this? And is it because it's just my brain being lazy and not wanting to learn something new? Or is there something behind it? Another reason could be cognitive dissonance. It's already been mentioned by Marcin yesterday. He called it cognitive bias. It's actually that our brain it has the tendency, if we get information that, that doesn't agree with our beliefs and our thoughts, that, co that, that causes discomfort. You can see it with people who smoke. Um, if they see another research that, that says that smoking will, will make sure that you die younger or, or that you get lung cancer or any other disease, people tend to say, yeah, my brother-in-law did this all the time. He said, yeah, well, my grandfather, he, he smoked and he was like 90, he, he became 96 before he died. So we tried to get different information to make, to justify what our behavior and, and beliefs are at that time. There was research done in, in the 50s with a cult that believed that the world was going to end. Well, we've seen these cults before. They had a certain date and everybody, the, the entire cult was sure that the world was going to end. The date that they said the world was going to end, the world didn't end because we're still here. And the researchers thought that then because they had contrary uh, um, uh, evidence that they would say, okay, we were wrong apparently, the world didn't end. But that didn't happen. They find new information to justify what they did and that they got the date wrong. And there are two ways to handle cognitive dissonance. One thing is get information or justify what you are doing to, to get it into that direction. The other one is to try and change your beliefs. This is the more difficult one, as we said, we are lazy, but that's the one you really want to achieve. You could also see there was a, a research done with people who had to do a really tedious job. At the end, one of the group, uh, half of the group was given a, a dollar and they were saying like, okay, here you have a dollar. Would you please tell the people after you that it was a really great job? And the other group, they gave $20. And they said, okay, would you please tell the group next to you that it was a really awesome job? And then after that, they asked the people separately, did you really find it a nice job? The people who got a dollar actually changed their perception because the dollar wasn't enough for them to justify what they were saying. $20 apparently is enough for, for us to justify to lie, so we don't change our beliefs. $1 wasn't enough, so we had to change our beliefs. So it's really important that if we get new information, that we give it in a way that people can use it to change the way they believe at the moment. Yeah, and one of the problems that we also have is a lot of our culture is about having a zero-fault culture. <laughs> And there's a lot of blaming. So basically, also sometimes when we tease Agile, we will say, okay, so you go into the sprint and you commit to the sprint goal and you say that you will do this within the sprint. And once we fail, someone will go say, hey, you promised me that you would deliver this in the sprint. And what I've seen in Denmark also is that during all this crisis, this has just become more and more um, apparent in all the companies because all of a sudden, uh, they start firing people, like in banking in Denmark. Banking has always been like, if you have a job in banking, you're good for life. You leave a bank if you choose to, but there's no firing. And during this crisis, we actually had started having 
people getting fired, which meant that people were afraid of making mistakes. And we tend to have this. We tend to have this. We want to have the zero-fold culture. We want to have the zero-box software. And we want to be perfect. And we also do it as people, not only in software. We do it as people. We want to be perfect people. And there's always this about not having faults. And that also means that if I try something and it doesn't work, I fail. So what we need to do is to find something where it's okay to fail, where it's okay to make an experiment. And you can start out small, and you can do something really small like, um, I tried to make the coffee yesterday and it was really, really bad in our apartment. That's really small. And I could be say like, okay, I'm the first one up and I need to make coffee for the other one so I have a responsibility. So I could have panicked about that. And some people will do, even if it's a small thing that you never tried before. But tried it out. So we need... And, and it went horribly and, wrong. The coffee was awful. Yeah, the coffee was awful. So the coffee was really, really awful. Sorry, sorry. Today I had Susie instead and she made good coffee. So, um, but I tried it out. And that's okay. And nobody says, you made really bad coffee, except for now. But um, that's Lillian. Um, so that's also something that you can do to have changes, is to have built a culture where it's okay to fail. I don't want to, another one, this is from Cotter. Well, he mentions it a lot. No sense of urgency. If people don't know why they should change, why should they change? Because they are told so. When people change because they are told so, there will become a, f a false sense of urgency. People will run around and they will make all kinds of, 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 they will do a lot of work, but they don't know what they are really working on. What is the sense of urgency? The sense of urgency should be a positive thing. It should not be a negative thing. If you go to your organization and you say, from, oh my God, it's really going wrong. We make a, a shitty product. Our, all our, um, our competitors are doing a way better job. And if we go on like this, we will all lose our jobs we will get fear and fear paralyzes. So your sense of urgency should be your friend, not your enemy. So what you should do is you should think of, um, look around, what are opportunities? How can we become better? How we can, can we come, become better than our competitors? Look at it in a positive way. It's like I'm an agile coach. If I would think like, oh my God, Gitty is so much better. I could never become as good as she can. And then I would paralyze, I would stand still. What I should be thinking is, oh my God, Gita learned this and this, and I think it really helps her. Maybe I should do that as well. And I look at my clients, what do they need? How can I help them even better? That is what motivates people. If there is no sense of urgency, it's often easy to see. There are a lot of meetings if there's no real sense of urgency with no outcomes. If you ask someone, like, really, this is important, and someone says, yeah, it's really important, we should, I, I will make a meeting for next week. Then that's like saying to your five-year-old who says he has to go to the bathroom, like, okay, we just need to go to two more stores and then we go home and you can go pee. Then apparently you do not see the sense of urgency. So a sense of urgency is really important. And it's also important to um, do it in a way that people on the business floor actually um, understand it. I've seen it happen a lot of times that, that um, uh, CEOs would mention what the sense of urgency is, usually in the bad way, like we're going down, there are no sales anymore. And they do it in, with so figures that people don't understand. So they they're like walk away and they think like, okay, apparently there's a sense of urgency, but we do not really know where it comes from. So it's also important that the sense of urgency is clear. And, and there can also be the feeling of lost. So there can be the feeling of loss that if you change something, you will lose what you already have. And it can be all kinds of things. It can, for instance, it can be your identity. So if you are the top programmer in the group and everyone comes to you and now say, okay, we're going to do agile. We're going to work in a team and we're going to have that everyone works together and nobody's going to be the top developer. Then you lose your identity. So there's a lot of places where you can have this feeling of loss. And again, a lot of it is because we like to do things automatically. So once we cannot do this anymore, we get a feeling of loss. And we have some contrast. Actually, um, there was some research done on the feeling of loss and that it has the same stages of mourning. At first there's, there's denial, like it's not gonna happen, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with me. And then there becomes the, 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 the guilt and the angry, like what I've been doing wrong all this time, wasn't it right what I did? 
um, um, and I don't want to change. It's been right the way it was. And then in the end, if you are lucky, you get acceptance and moving on. So the, we're not saying that this list is extensive. There are way more reasons why people um, um, can have resistance to change. What we'd like to do now is, from our own experience, tell you what we think you could do to help people who, who experience resistance to change, or yourself, if you experience it. First thing is, take fears and objections seriously. Like we mentioned, we're talking about people. So even if you think it's not rational, for, to them it is important, and to them it is rational. So take it seriously is, first, is the first step. Involve everybody, and involve everybody does not mean that you have one meeting in which you tell, this is our plan, this is what we thought of, and this is what we're going to do. Involve everything means from the beginning, because it is what Tom said, if, if, if the ideas come from the people themselves, the resistance to change will be much less, and in general, people themselves know very well what has to happen, even better than management, who sits somewhere above everybody. So involve everybody, it also means that you cannot just have a meeting and say, OK, so we have to change. Go ahead, do it. You have to give some guidance. You have to say, like, OK, I think we, you know, maybe we together we can see some areas in which we need to change. We can form some groups. And in the beginning, you will guide them. And then you say, OK, maybe you can take over from here. There needs to be some guidance. You cannot expect from people who have been doing what they're told to do for a long time to suddenly do it themselves, to suddenly become self-organizing and know what to do. Give information. It's the most important thing. Communicate, communicate, communicate. If you can't communicate anything, communicate that you cannot communicate anything. Just always keep saying what's happening, what's the progress, what's, what, what does it mean for you? It also means that you have to give the information in a certain way. When um, people were told that they were, getting, um, they, would have to, they were not getting fired, but they did get a different job, we sent out letters to the people who, were getting, who were, did have to apply. We did this on a, we thought it through very well, we thought, uh, we did this on a Friday, we first sent out an email that today people would get the news if they would have to um, apply for a new job or not. Then, and Friday when they got home, they got the letter. So they had the entire weekend to think about it, and on Monday we had a meeting with all these people. The people felt horrible. They felt like they were put aside, like they were fired, um, and I learned from that that we should have done it in person. There was a reason why we did not do it in person, because we were afraid if we weren't going to say it to someone, we would say, well, all the project managers are going to be laid off and need a new job. But still, we, may, we handle with people, and you do not want to have people feel like this. So the way you communicate is very important, the way you give information. Provide education and guidance. This is the part of self-doubt. This one is actually kind of easy to help with. You can give people education, you can give them guidance. It's much better, easier than un uncertainty, because uncertainty will be there. We will keep changing, so there will be uncertainty, because we want continuous improvement. We want Kaizen, which means we will be changing. So don't try to comfort people in uncertainty. Try to teach them to handle uncertainty. And the last one, be open and realistic. If you do know there will be people laid off, if you do know some things will happen, that will not be good news. Do mention it. Do it in a specific way, like I mentioned. Don't just throw out an email. But it doesn't help if you keep it to yourself. In general, it will just... Someone will hear it, there will be gossip, which will be much worse, because we do not like uncertainty. We prefer the certainty. So an um, important thing that is also when we go into change is that, as I mentioned before, we really like to be in our comfort zone. That's where we do things automatically. And when we uh, are going to change, we need to move outside of this, because if we don't move outside of this, we will not move outside our automatic system. But the important thing is to move out only into the learning zone, where things are a little bit dangerous, but it's okay, and then you can go back. And the important thing about actually moving a little bit, learning something, and then going back to your comfort zone is that that makes your comfort zone grow. And sometimes it won't. Sometimes you will go out, you'll try something, and you'll say, fuck, I'm never going to do this again, or it's so horrible, um, I might do it again, but it's still not me. But if you don't go back, what happens is that you will keep moving out here. You will move out into the danger zone, which also means that when we go in and change organizations, if we just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, people will move out into their danger zones and they will get stressed, they will be demotivated, they will be really scared. 
So when you do changes, and this also counts for yourself. So as I said before, I was terrified of speaking. I mean, seven years ago, I got a goal from my manager. You need to be able to say something in a room with your team. And I'm talking my team, I was working with every day. If we had a meeting, I could not speak. So what I did was um, I went out into schools and talked to girls about what's it like to be a computer scientist as a woman. Because I knew that, I was a woman, I'm a computer scientist, how does it work? And I went out into schools because that was really safe. There were little girls there just listening to me. They would be around 10, 12 years old. So that was kind of safe. Then I started moving into education fairs. Big fairs where people would come and listen to what is computer science. And I would talk about it there. And I kept moving back into my comfort zone and kind of saying, and relaxing and figuring out that went well. So that was kind of my way of starting this change. And as I found out, I had all these small successes and it was okay. And nobody's actually going to kill me if I say something wrong on stage. I became more and more confident and I kept moving. So now my comfort zone of speaking in public is really, really huge. If somebody asked me, could you go tomorrow and talk about retrospectives at a conference with 2,000 people, I would say, yeah, no problem. Even though I don't have a presentation ready. Um, so that's where I got at. But it doesn't have to be the way. It's not always that you can actually grow this. But a way of growing it is taking all these baby steps. You can actually compare this. Yesterday we talked about flow. If people are too long in their comfort zone, they will get bored. If they're too long in their danger zone, they will get burned out. So you have to try to keep them in the yellow zone. They have to try to keep themselves in the yellow zone. This actually also happened in psychology. If people ha have a fear of going outside, first you just take a little step, you go in out to the front door and you go back. If that feels comfortable, you go to the grocery store on the, on the corner. So this is actually used for other fears as well. Also for arachnophobia, but I'm not going to try it. So what can we do? So one thing that we can do is create a no blame culture. So the prime directive, for instance, of our retrospectives is we truly believe that anyone did the best they could do with the resources at hand. So if we create this non-blame culture, and if something goes wrong, we take it as this is something we can learn from. So creating a culture where it's okay to fail, where it's safe to fail, and make small experiments so that it is actually safe to fail. And sometimes we will fail big. But if we have a culture that's zero-fault culture, we will not make experiments because we know we will be punished if we fail. So if we can make a culture where it's okay to fail and not being blamed, then it will help a lot with change. Another really important thing, Lillian also said, take people's fears seriously. Because you can go into an organization or into a team or whatever and saying, that's just stupid, there's nothing to be afraid of. That's not gonna help anyone. So take their fears seriously and listen to them. Actively listen to them. Don't listen to be able to respond, but listen to them so that you know what makes them afraid or resistant to this change. And you might even learn from it because they might have a valid point. And give them time. It takes time. You're not just going to be saying, oh, hey, we'll take you to a two day scrum master class. So now we are going to be self organized. Go do. It takes time and it takes time to build these things in. So this is me. Um, in my former job, I worked for IBM. So this is me being an IBM consultant at a client. Um, so I am a ninja, or at least I try to be, so I do the crane. Um, and this is what I'm doing here. So this is my new apprentice. And this is one of the tools that I personally use when I go out to a client. Because the fact that I'm not afraid to be a little bit silly makes people feel comfortable. Because what they expect a lot of times when they hear an IBM consultant coming out, first of all, they expect, expect a man in a suit, really stiff, talking to them about serious stuff. And then they get me. Um, which makes them relax because I'm not as scary. I know I have an advantage in IT because I'm a woman. So a lot of men don't see me as competition, which makes it a lot easier to come in and help them. But also the fact that I'm not afraid to do silly stuff. I'm not afraid to have fun. I'm not afraid to be who I am. Is part of what helps people realize 
that it's okay to do stuff. And also, when I do mistakes, if I do have a training and I do a mistake, I will say it. This is a really good example. I just said this wrong, and now I'm going to learn from it. And that's what we need to build into your culture. So using myself as a role model to help people. So I'm kind of crazy enough to apply this to myself. So yes, that is a real tattoo. Um, and I am terrified of needles. So I got this tattoo because to me, this being brave enough to be myself and to embrace change is so important to me. So one thing that you can do is also have a little courage. And courage does not mean to remove all fears. Because as I said before, fears are really, really important to us because they teach us something. It is stupid to go to somebody and ask them, would you please stick me in my arm with a needle? That's stupid. So there's a reason I'm afraid of needles. Put some ink in my arm because my blood will really like that. There's something wrong about that. So the fears are okay. So you think I'm talking too much? Oh, our time is almost. Ah, damn it. Okay. So I'm talking too much, so I'm giving the word to Lillian. <laughs> I thought you were done. <laughs> Another thing is if you feel that you, that you have resistance, if you feel that you are scared, find other people, talk to them, see how you can help them. It, it, it was what Liz talked about yesterday. Make friends, make friends in other teams, see how you can help each other. Ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It's not a weakness, it's a strength. So try to create networks, try to, to connect to people. It's a really important one. Yeah, so ask for help. If it's yourself, ask for help, take small steps, um, and listen to your fears, and figure out if there's something that is real behind that. It might just be that you're afraid because of the chains, but there might also be some reasons behind it. So, the wrap-up is, give people the power, but do guide them. Aim for the heart, don't aim for the head, and don't boot also for resistance, but it will, it will only cause more resistance, and you will fail. And again, we're dealing with people. And people respect. They, they deserve respect. Yeah. So if you have any questions, please come talk to us. We will be here the rest of the day. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>